Peter Sprague is the Senior Fellow for Policy Studies at the Family Research Council in Washington, D.C. He came to FRC in 2001, and his research and his writing have addressed issues of marriage and family, human sexuality, the art and entertainment, and religion and public life. Uh, Peter is the author of the book, Outrage, How Gay Activists and Liberal Judges Are Trashing Democracy to Redefine Marriage. And he's the co-editor of the FRC book, Getting It Straight, What the Research Shows About Homosexuality. And so uh, Peter Spriggs, one of the nation's leading experts on this issue, joins us this morning. Let's give him a warm welcome. Peter. Thank you, Sandy, and thank you to all of you for being here. It's an honor to be a keynote speaker today. Uh, of course, I cannot claim to speak for all of the leaders and experts you'll hear from today uh, who will follow me. But I will try to live up to the keynote designation by striking the right note and establishing a key in which most of us can sing. Um, with that said, how do we begin doing what this event is about? Understanding homosexuality. I believe that a key reason there is so much division over this issue is that there are not just conflicting opinions about particular points, but conflicting paradigms, completely different conceptual frameworks for understanding homosexuality. The dominant paradigm in secular culture, uh, including in the media and in the educational establishment, is what I call the gay identity paradigm. The gay identity paradigm includes the belief that being gay is an innate characteristic which cannot change and does no harm. However, the truth is that the empirical case for the gay identity paradigm is weak. And in any case, social conservatives do not view homosexuality from the perspective of the flawed gay identity paradigm. So what is homosexuality? Or more broadly, what is sexual orientation? I would argue that sexual orientation is not just one thing which is easily defined. In reality, sexual orientation is a term which, depending on the context, may be used to refer to any one or a combination of three different factors. A person's sexual attractions, their sexual behavior, and their sexual self-identification. Uh, in order to address the issue effectively, we must distinguish between these elements of sexual orientation. Now, this view is not original to me or unique to social conservatism. Uh, for example, the American Psychological Association, which has been engaged in pro-homosexual activism for decades, wrote this in their amicus brief to the U.S. Supreme Court in support of redefining marriage. Quote, sexual orientation refers to an enduring disposition to experience sexual, affectional, or romantic attractions to men, women, or both. It also encompasses an individual's sense of personal and social identity based on those attractions, behaviors expressing them, and membership in a community of others who share them. Note here that the APA included all three of the factors I mentioned, attractions, behavior, and identity, plus a fourth, membership in a community. Now, I want to add a note here, I wasn't quite sure where to put it, but I'll say it here, about the language we use in discussing this issue. The very words gay and lesbian tend to reinforce the gay identity paradigm, since they carry with them the implication that they describe some people's innate identity. That is a good reason to avoid using those words. Ideally, we would explain which element of sexual orientation we are discussing every time. We would refer to people who experience same-sex attractions, people who engage in homosexual conduct, or people who self-identify as gay or lesbian. In practice, that can be cumbersome. 
So I will stipulate at the outset that when I use the word homosexuals, I mean people who choose to engage in homosexual conduct. And when I use the words gay or lesbian, I am either referring to people who self-identify as such, or I am paraphrasing messages that are commonly heard in the culture. Now, out of these three or four elements of sexual orientation, we as social conservatives view homosexual conduct as the most important in social and moral terms. Therefore, we operate from what I call a homosexual conduct paradigm. The conflict between these two paradigms explains why even a, the simplest of statements can be interpreted very differently. A social conservative, for example, might make a simple declarative statement such as, homosexuality is wrong, or I oppose homosexuality. A person operating from the gay identity paradigm will take this as denigrating the personhood of gay people. Yet this is not our intention. When we say we are against homosexuality, what we mean is that homosexual conduct is objectively harmful to the people who engage in it and to society at large. Now, I mentioned earlier that the empirical presuppositions of the gay identity paradigm are weak. For example, this paradigm is based on a belief that same-sex attractions develop because of a biological or genetic characteristic that is present at birth, which cannot be changed. However, the search for a gay gene has essentially collapsed in failure. Even, again, the liberal American Psychological Association has stated, quote, there is no consensus among scientists about the exact reasons that an individual develops a heterosexual, bisexual, gay, or lesbian orientation." Close quote. One reason believers in the gay paradigm fail to adequately distinguish sexual attractions, sexual behavior, and sexual identity is that they assume that these three elements of sexual orientation will always be consistent with each other. They assume, in other words, that a person who experiences same-sex attractions will engage only in homosexual conduct and will self-identify as gay or lesbian. Yet survey data on sexuality makes clear that this is not the case. In addition, each of these uh, elements of sexual orientation may not be, each of these elements separately may not be consistent in one person over time. Personal testimonies, clinical experience, and peer-reviewed research have all shown that some people can and do experience change in all three elements of sexual orientation. Their identity, their conduct, and yes, even in their sexual attractions. Now, occasionally someone in the media will ask one of us or ask a politician, do you think people are born gay or do they choose to be gay? I would say the correct answer to this question is no. <laughs> the, the question poses a false dichotomy because neither of these formulations is really accurate. People are certainly not born gay. There is no gay gene or other biological factor that causes a fixed and immutable homosexual orientation at birth. However, it would be simplistic to just say that People, are, people choose to be gay. I do not believe that people generally choose to experience same-sex attractions. However, people do choose what to do about them. They choose whether or not to engage in homosexual conduct, and they choose whether or not to self-identify as gay or lesbian. The fact that people do not choose to experience same-sex attractions does not mean, however, that such attractions are inborn. There is good evidence that same-sex attractions uh, result from experiences or developmental forces in childhood and early adolescence. If that is true, then they are neither inborn nor chosen. Well, what about the conservative claim in the homosexual conduct paradigm that, that homosexual conduct is harmful? Well, the harms associated with homosexuality include both physical health problems such as the high rates of HIV and AIDS uh, and other sexually transmitted diseases among homosexual men, 
and high rates of mental illness and substance abuse as well. These pathologies and the cost of treating them imposes harm upon society. Those who believe the gay identity paradigm claim that such mental health problems are caused by societal discrimination against homosexuals. That theory is undermined, however, by research that shows such problems are prevalent at high rates, even in cultures where homosexuality is widely accepted. The conflict between the gay identity paradigm and the homosexual conduct paradigm helps to explain the contours of the public policy debates related to homosexuality. To those who operate from the gay identity paradigm, the policy question is simple. Should gay people be treated equally or not? For social conservatives who operate from the homosexual conduct paradigm, however, the real question is, how should homosexual conduct and homosexual relationships be treated by the law? Should they be discouraged, which is the social conservative ideal? Uh, should they be treated as purely private, a libertarian view? Or should homosexual conduct and relationships be protected, affirmed, celebrated, and even subsidized, not just privately, but by force of law? Now let's be clear, the latter option is the uncompromising demand of the homosexual movement. I'd like to comment on one aspect of this agenda which the courts have not yet removed from the hands of the people and their elected representatives to decide. I'm talking about the efforts to add sexual orientation and now gender identity to uh, protected categories in laws which uh, prohibit discrimination in areas such as employment, housing, and public accommodations. These non-discrimination laws are routinely referred to as civil rights laws, but in a way that term is a misnomer. The dictionary defines civil rights as, quote, rights belonging to a person by virtue of his status as a citizen or as a member of civil society, close quote. The Bill of Rights in the U.S. Constitution, for example, guarantees every American certain rights, such as the right to freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and freedom of the press. These are true civil rights in that they belong to every person as a citizen or member of a civil society. But when homosexual activists talk about civil rights, they are usually not talking about their constitutional rights which have never been systematically denied to them as a class, unlike the historical experience of African Americans. Instead, they are talking about civil rights in, in the sense that the term was used in the Civil Rights Act of 1964, a law which laid down five protected categories in which it was made illegal for private employers or businesses to practice discrimination. Now, the true constitutional rights I mentioned place a restriction on the actions of governments. Laws that bar employment discrimination, for example, uh, place a restriction upon the action of private entities, such as corporations, in carrying out their private business. The extension of historic constitutional rights is a win-win situation. When a constitutional right is extended to a group previously deprived of it, no one else suffers any reduction of their rights as a result. But the extension of laws against discrimination is more of a zero-sum game. When one person, such as the employment applicant, wins more protection, another, the employer, actually loses a corresponding measure of freedom. This is why lawmakers should be exceedingly cautious rather than generous about expanding the categories of protection against private discrimination. Now, Because of our national shame at the historic legacy of racial discrimination against African Americans, many people have come to think of all discrimination as inherently evil. However, the basic meaning of discrimination, of, of to discriminate, is simply to make a distinction to care, compare and evaluate candidates for a job on any basis is inherently discrimination. The argument for, uh, the argument for outlawing discrimination 
in private action, such as employment, is strongest when based on a personal characteristic that falls into one of five categories that I call the five I's, because, because each begins with the letter I. We generally protect against discrimination based on characteristics that are inborn, involuntary, meaning you can't choose them, immutable, meaning you can't change them, innocuous, meaning they do no harm, and or in the Constitution of the United States. Now, is sexual orientation, like race and sex, a characteristic that is inborn, involuntary, immutable, innocuous, and in the Constitution? Is it like religion, which is not inborn, involuntary, um, immutable, or necessarily innocuous, but is in the Constitution, is it a characteristic that meets even one of these criteria? I would argue the answer is no. Sexual attractions may meet the one criterion of being involuntary, but there is no way homosexual activists would concede that such laws do not also protect their chosen sexual conduct. And the choice to engage in homosexual acts is certainly not inborn, involuntary, immutable, innocuous, or in the Constitution. Now, some people have begun to seek compromise between the left and the right on this issue. I want to explain why I personally think this approach is unwise and such a compromise is unsustainable for three reasons. First, as I have already explained, I believe it is wrong in principle to include sexual orientation and gender identity uh, as protected categories because they are unlike historically protected categories such as race. There is legitimate concern that such laws would infringe in particular on religious liberty, but that is not the only concern about them. More fundamentally, they infringe on liberty in general without adequate justification. Second, there is no religious exemption that would be acceptable to homosexual activists and would also be adequate to fully protect against all the potential threats to religious freedom. Only a blanket conscience exemption, which applies to profit-making businesses and individuals, as well as to religious ministries and churches, would be adequate. But such a provision would essentially nullify the law. The free exercise of religion is a fundamental liberty under our Constitution, quite literally our first freedom under the First Amendment. It is not something to be traded away or cut up into pieces in a process of legislative log rolling. The, um, <coughs> Finally, I, I would note that um, non-discrimination laws are never morally neutral. They send the message that it is morally wrong to disapprove of homosexual conduct. For such laws to be endorsed by citizens or legislators who believe that it is morally wrong to engage in homosexual conduct is a logical contradiction. There is one final question I would like to answer. What motivates us to do what we do? Why do we as pro-family activists insist on standing against the homosexual agenda? Our opponents would have you believe that the that the reason is a four-letter word that begins with H. Nothing could be further from the truth. Now, I will say that there is one small group in our society that I will unequivocally condemn on this score, the so-called Westboro Baptist Church. I believe we should condemn their hate-filled rhetoric. But we should not apologize for them because we are not responsible for them. They do not represent us, and they never have. We in the pro-family movement are motivated by love, not hate. Both the, Old Testaments and the, both the Old and New Testaments contain the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. The question is not whether we should love our family members, our co-workers, and our neighbors who self-identify as gay or lesbian. The real question is, what does love require? Homosexual activists argue that love requires giving them everything they want and allowing them to indulge every desire. 
But most people who pause to think about it, certainly everyone who has ever been a parent, knows that this is not love. In fact, it may be the opposite of love. The essence of love is desiring the best for someone and acting to bring that about. We love those who experience same-sex attractions, but we sincerely believe that engaging in homosexual relationships is never the best way of advancing the long-term health and happiness of our loved ones. For example, since the beginning of the, epide of the epidemic, over 300,000 American men have died of AIDS whose only risk factor was that they had sex with other men. We do not celebrate those deaths. On the contrary, we mourn them. We wish that those men were still alive, contributing all of their gifts and talents to American society. The reason they died is because they chose to have sex with men, not because conservatives told them not to. We do no one a kindness by denying the truth. The truth is powerful and will ultimately prevail. Thank you for standing for the truth. Thank you.